Welcome to Matterport Scanning for Insurance. Will you be a Matterport Scanning expert by the time you're done watching this video? Probably not, but you definitely will be able to get on site and scan a proper digital twin of the property. And once you've done that 10 to 20 times, you will definitely be an advanced user. But for this training, I wanna break it up into three sections. What to pack in your bag so you have everything you need on site, how to walk the property and the things you wanna think through as you do that, and then of course we'll cover basic scanning techniques. I've broken up this video into chapters so you can quickly skip to the one you need. With that said, let's check out what's in your bag. This is my bag. This has everything I could possibly want in it. As you can see, it has a tripod. Let me get that off. This is a prosumer level tripod to be used with the Pro 2 or Pro 3 cameras. If you're using a 360 camera, you're not gonna wanna use this. I have another tripod for that. I have a quick release clamp. Again, this is to be used with the Pro 2 and the prosumer level tripod. This is an extender and highly recommended for 360 camera usage. I can extend the camera just a little bit off the tripod that allows me to plug in an external battery in case I need it. This is the tripod I use when using a 360 camera like the Ricoh Theta or Insta360. Of course, I've got the Pro 2. If you're using a Pro 3 instead of a Pro 2, that too can fit in this case. Any roll of masking tape is really handy. I use this when taping the external battery to the tripod. Of course, I have my iPad to connect to the camera. All the chargers I need for the iPad, for the Pro 2. If I'm bringing a Pro 3, then I'll have two fully charged batteries with me and the charger. And of course, the USB cable I need running from the external battery to my 360 camera. Door stops. I highly recommend bringing a couple door stops with you. You never know when you're gonna run into a door that just doesn't wanna stay open and you need to have it open. So highly recommended, bring some door stops with you. As mentioned, the external battery for my 360 camera. And of course, the 360 camera. This is the Ricoh Theta Z1. Now you made it on site. You've got everything you could possibly need with you. And the first thing you do, you don't unpack your bag. The first thing you do is you walk around the property and get to know what you're about to scan. As you walk around the property, start to build an idea in your head of where you want to place that first scan position, how you want to walk around the room and make your way out of that room into adjacent rooms. Only once you have all that figured out, then you can go ahead and start your first scan. So let's go ahead and look through this demo property to see how we would go about scanning this. So when I walk through the front door, you can see here's the front door. And as I walk in, we have the living room. I can go upstairs and have a look at what's going on up here. You also want to take note of the areas that you want to have included in the scan. So when you scan a property, it's important to think about fleshing out the complete 3D model. If I look at this and we look at all the floors, you can see that the complete 3D model is fully fleshed out. We even have scans of the attic up here. There is also, so there's this detached storage unit that I can't access from within the house itself. I have to walk around the outside. So do you have a Pro 3 that can scan outside? If like today, there's enough shadow from the house, maybe I can stay close enough to the house and scan this with a Pro 2 or 360 camera, but I can also just scan the storage unit as a completely separate model altogether and not have to worry about connecting it to the main house. If I go over here further, I can see that there's another door from the outside, again, not connected to the main house that allows me access to the crawl space. So do I want this to be part of the same model or should I have a separate model for the crawl space by itself? For this property, I could end up with three models, the main house, the storage unit, and the crawl space, depending on what camera I have and how I wanna go about scanning this. If you're not scanning with a Pro 3 and there's a bunch of daylight outside, you might be best off just splitting this up into three models. So as I mentioned, you wanna think about fully fleshing out the 3D model so that the gestures can take proper measurements of everything they need, and navigation, allowing the adjuster to easily navigate exactly where they need to in order to see what they need to see. So in this model, as an example, you can see that in this corner, I have a stain that I will definitely want to identify and point out. I need to position the camera in such a way so that the adjuster can easily navigate to this area and have clear visibility of the stain and the surroundings so that they can provide the best possible estimate. To scan this specific property, we did have a Pro 3 with us, so we went ahead and scanned the outside. Depending on your specific situation and the damage cost of the property, you may not even need to include those exterior scan positions. It's always advised to start on the lowest floor possible if we are talking about a multi-story unit and you don't have to start at the front door. Remember, we're not creating a virtual walkthrough for the adjuster. We're collecting scan positions to generate a 3D digital twin. Usually the best place to start is at the lowest level in some corner of the room. So you can start scanning that room and work your way into the adjacent areas. And that's it. So with this property, remember we have that storage unit that needs to get scanned. 
the crawl space that needs to get scanned, and the main house that needs to get scanned. So for that reason, depending on the camera that I have with me, I would either break this up into three separate models, or as we did in this case, because we had the Pro 3, we just went ahead and combined everything into a single digital twin. Now that you've got an idea of the property, where you want to begin and how you're going to scan through it, let's go ahead and set up the tripod and camera. To do that, I'm going to refer you to one of these other four videos that I've linked to in the corner. Choose the video that applies to your camera and come back here when you're all done. The first basic rule of scanning is understanding scan density and the path of aligned scans. And what I mean by that is this. As I walk through here, you can see that this scan position over here is labeled one. And if I look back over here, here's number two and three and four and over here is five. So I can see exactly how this room was scanned. The scan density in this room is totally fine. I wouldn't have any fewer scan positions than this because there is a lot of stuff in this room and you want to make sure to capture it from different angles. But the path of aligned scans could have possibly been improved. Because my last scan position in this room is number five right over here, if I go to that scan position and I look into the adjacent room, there isn't a whole lot that I can see from here. If I go into the other room, scan number six from this scan position, there isn't a whole lot that I can see from this scan position into the other room. Because I'm using the Pro 3, it's very, very forgiving in how much of the environment I see it. It aligns very, very well. But if I was using a different camera, I would definitely want to have a scan position right here in the middle, one that can see both rooms. And that will allow the system to align much, much more easily. And a more easy alignment is a faster alignment, allowing you to move on to the next scan position faster. So again, I would have started over here where we did at number one. And then instead of coming over here in front of the doorway at number two, could have gone over here to number five, make this number two instead. These two are within line of sight, wouldn't have any problems aligning. Then go over here, scan number three, scan number four, work my way around the room in this pattern. And number five, the last scan position would have been right in front of the door on my way into the adjacent room. Again, if I was using a different camera, I probably would have had to place a position right here at the threshold of the doorway, giving me that view into both rooms, making alignment a lot easier. Once I'm done with that, I can move into scan number six over here and proceed with the adjacent room. As you can see here as well, I have a scan position number seven that's over in this corner, and that's just to better flesh out the environment over here. Even though scan number six can see everything, from here I have a different perspective, and if there was anything that I needed to take account of, I would be more easily able to do that from this position. So it's important to add a scan position in case you think you might need it, just to be on the safe side. You certainly don't want to have to go back on site to scan more positions. So if you think you might need it, just go ahead and capture it while you're already there. As for the mini map that is slowly being fleshed out on your iPad or phone, whatever device you have connected to your camera, it's very, very important to keep an eye on that dark blue dot. The dark blue dot is the last scan position that was captured and aligned. And it's very important to look at that every time a scan aligns to make sure that the blue dot appears where you had the tripod placed. The system does the best it can with finding alignment. Sometimes it makes a mistake. And it's really on you, the scan tech, to make sure that if the system does make that mistake, you can easily rectify it either by trying to realign that position or just deleting it, moving the camera to a previously scanned position and scanning again. Being closer to a scan position that's already been captured provides more overlapping scan data with the two scan positions. And that makes it easier for the system to find alignment. So definitely keep that in mind. If you are running into alignment issues with your scanning, make those scan positions closer together. If you have a more open space that doesn't have so much stuff in the way, then you can take more distance between scan positions. But in this case, because we are dealing with residential real estate and a lot of stuff in the way, you really wanna keep those scan positions a lot closer together. So I would recommend five to six feet. And if you're using a 360 camera, I would recommend even tighter, maybe something like four to five feet between scan positions. This property happens to have stairs and we do get a lot of questions on how to properly scan a staircase. In order to answer that, I'm gonna refer you to a couple more videos over here. One is how to scan stairs with the Pro 2 or Pro 3 camera, and the other is how to scan stairs with the 360 camera. Go ahead and check those out at your convenience. Now let's talk about markings. Markings can be created in the Matterport app throughout the scanning process. You have trim, window, and mirror markings. The one most critical marking that I highly recommend everybody add every time they run across this is the mirror marking. Mirror markings are the most important because the camera is going to see things reflected in the mirror. And whatever it sees reflected in the mirror, it's going to think is another room on the other side of that mirror. It can't identify the mirror as a mirror. You need to tell it, no, that's not a window into another room. That's actually just a mirror. So you mark it and that way it knows to ignore whatever it thinks it sees on the other side. That could definitely save you from potentially misaligning or not aligning 
when you get to scanning the area right on the other side of that mirror. Certainly an option, but definitely less important to mark are windows and trim. Let me go ahead and show you what it would look like if this property was not marked with windows and trim. So let's look at this from the dollhouse perspective. You can see here that if I look at these windows, for example, I can see that they are filled in. So all the windows here, this one, this one, they're all, they're all filled in because they were all marked. You can also see this area up here that is not accurate to what the roof line would be. And that's because of the window marking. The window marking actually created that extra mesh where it shouldn't have any. Same thing over here. You can see this window was marked and it created this little block of window marking. And that's because when you mark a window, the marking is from the floor all the way to the ceiling. And it can't stop at an angle like this roof line. It's just a big brick. So that's why you have this. Now, does it really matter in this use case? No, probably not. The adjuster would be able to easily identify this and understand what's going on, even with this window marking there. So it really doesn't matter. Trim markings, you can see over here, around the sidewalk that is around this entire house, we have a nice clean model. If I was to look at this without the trim or the window markings, it would look something like this. This is what you can expect without any trim or window markings. Now again, does it make the adjuster's job any more difficult? No, but it is a slightly larger model and moving around it, depending on the machine being used, it might be a little bit more challenging because of all that extra information. So if you wanna throw some trim markings to keep the model a bit cleaner, go ahead and do that. It's really a personal preference. As for the windows, you can see that without the window marking, I can see right through these windows. They're not kind of filled in, I have these holes in there. But again, I don't think the adjuster in this case is gonna get a more accurate estimate with the windows fleshed out. So it's a matter of personal preference. Now let's talk about kitchen cabinets. With the kitchen cabinets, you wanna have them both open and closed. It's not something that you probably wanna do in a single pass. So my recommendation would be to scan the entire kitchen with the cabinets fully closed. Then you can come back and do one of two things. One, you can add 360 views. To do that, you go ahead and press the option button right next to the scan button and choose 360 view from the options there. That'll allow you to capture a 360 view that is not aligned with the rest of the scan positions that you've captured already. This will incorporate that view, that image of the kitchen cabinet open as part of the overall model data and the adjuster will be able to access it very easily. The other option you can do is just have another scan of the kitchen all by itself as a separate digital twin with all the cabinets open. Either way you go, you wanna keep in mind to adjust the camera higher for those high kitchen cabinets and a lot lower for the lower kitchen cabinets. The camera should be at about mid cabinet so that it can see everything into the cabinet. And you should also expect much higher scan density in this case, placing the camera directly in front of every open cabinet. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about sunlight. If you are using the Matterport Pro 2 camera, you might run into situations where the sunlight prevents the camera from being able to see the surfaces around it. That could definitely make it a lot more challenging for the system to find alignment and your digital twin at the end will have holes in it very much like the unmarked windows because the camera can't see those surfaces. And it's not always just the surfaces being hit by direct sunlight. White walls could bounce infrared light and make it very difficult for the camera to see those surfaces. So to compensate, you definitely want to close the blinds if that's an option. If it's not an option, scan what you can. You'll see in the mini map as it fleshes out the areas that were not picked up. When the sun has moved on, you can come back and have just a couple more scan positions of that area to fully flesh out the surfaces that weren't previously captured. Now that you are all done scanning, it's time to upload all this information to the cloud account so it can begin processing. I do not recommend doing that on site. So go back to the office or your home, connect your tablet or phone to your Wi-Fi and then begin the upload. It's also recommended to log into your account and make sure that you see that model data processing. It certainly doesn't happen often, but I have seen it happen before where on your mobile device, it says all the data was uploaded. But if a single file is not uploaded, it can't start processing. So log into your account, make sure that you see that model processing and then you are 100% good to go. And if by chance you don't see it processing, come back to your mobile device change the name of the model just a little bit, add the number two or anything like that, and then hit upload again. If you don't do any kind of changes and try to upload, it'll say, you haven't made any changes, why am I re-uploading and it won't allow it. So any kind of change, even just a simple name change in the model will allow it to re-upload that data and begin processing. And that is really it. Now you have all the information you need to scan a proper digital twin for your claim.